okay? Can everybody see it? Yes. All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the um, uh, the mainly, um, I mean, there, there has been a lot of discussions uh, nowadays uh, ever since the ever since the global financial crisis about uh, certain systematic violations to the no arbitrage conditions and usually they are measured by derivatives uh, versus uh, cash uh, market basis. So um, throughout this period, since the global financial crisis, there have been um, several, uh, not several, but a lot of papers uh, trying to explain these, uh, these uh, violations. And uh, so far, um, there has been papers who have explained why these divergence have, why these um, um, bases have actually occurred. Uh, but not why they persisted, and uh, even in, in tranquil times, like prior to COVID times. <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, another set of papers are uh, able to explain uh, why they persisted. However, there is no narrative, there is no story that actually connects the two. Uh, and actually provides one single uh, factor that maybe doesn't explain 100% of it, but at least um, you know it's it's something that is the the persistent element of this uh, of this uh, um, uh, um, how can I say, of this um, I'm trying to see the yeah okay of these arbitrages so-called arbitrages. In my paper, I actually uh, introduced something novel to, to, to this literature. Uh, and that novel thing is uh, the uh, introduction of collateralization to uh, these uh, derivative transactions that are involved in measuring the, uh, the, the basis or these arbitrage opportunities. And I will try to convince you that, um, at least for the case of the covered interest rate parity arbitrage, which is the example case in this, uh, in this paper, um, that uh, the collateralization is uh, the major or the persistent driver of these uh, uh, apparent violations uh, post-crisis. So, uh, my paper, the, obviously the result of my paper is that the, the proxy that I construct uh, for measuring this uh, collateralization adjustment uh, and the other metrics that I uh, use to actually, um, to actually um, characterize this uh, cost of collateral um, are uh, an important or it's, it's correlated with the um, uh, opportunity, uh, with the basis or the violations of the of the uh, covered interest rate parity between 68 to 87 percent for tenors between three and ten years which is a sizable a sizable correlation now i'm not just showing correlations i mean i have some regressions where um uh, and uh, of course models uh, where where we are looking where i'm looking at the contribution of this collateralization cost now, just as a brief, I know everybody is uh, kind of aware of the basic formula for the uh, covered interest rate parity, and that is, um, and I put it here in the in the format of what is the forward equal to. Um, it's equal to the, um, and I will just use the continuous time format. It is equal to the spot FX uh, uh, on the differential on on the differential of the interest rate between the between the countries. Now I have added here a B, which is actually uh, added to the foreign currency. I will refer to foreign currency, anything which is outside the dollar and domestic currency, anything which is the dollar. So for instance, one uh, foreign currency could be the Euro. Um, so I've added here a B, which actually represents the uh, basis. Now uh, it is added and it is also a market, uh, market convention to be added to the uh, foreign currency leg rather than to the domestic, but it can uh, obviously be added, uh, be switched on the other side. Um, so usually, uh, usually when this B is actually not equal to zero, okay, then there is an arbitrage opportunity uh, to uh, uh, borrow or, uh, and lend in the other currency, convert and lend in the other currency and uh, make a riskless profit of, uh, of, you know, whatever the basis is here. Uh, 
Now, what I want to draw your attention here is that for this condition to hold and this uh, to be zero, the covered interest rate parity specifies that this forward here should be uh, um, should should have no counterparty credit risk. And basically, which means that these uh, rates here are uh, riskless rates in each currency. Uh, otherwise, um, I mean, there is no way to say uh, that you can apply at all the CIP conditions. Um, it must be that they're, uh, they're risk plus rate. Now, this uh, uh, forward also, we, we should not forget that actually it is a derivative contract. And as a contract, it has terms and conditions of that contract. Uh, so um, my story here is that one of those terms and conditions um, is the collateral or how do you manage actually the collateral? And that is how uh, you know I explain some of the uh, why do we have this this basis here. So this B, by the way, if we look at it um, ever since the crisis, this is just some motivation for the major currencies against against the U.S. dollar, major G10 currencies has been negative uh, ever since the crisis. And it has been negative not only like until 2014, for instance, where you know after 2014, things are more tranquil. No, it actually continued even further uh, up to, to date uh, being negative. Now, obviously, you know, um, we want to uh, understand what it is that is driving it. Is it something, uh, and it must be something which is persistent throughout this, throughout this period. Um, so why is actually this, uh, quickly just, why is this important to, to study? I mean, uh, needless to say that the FX and the cross-currency markets are one of the most liquid and largest derivatives markets. Uh, for instance, according to the BIS, uh, since 2019, uh, there is an outstanding notion of 98 trillion. The average daily turnover uh, uh, of these contracts is um, around 3.3 trillion. And of course, the CIP arbitrage condition is uh, the cornerstone of um, one of the cornerstones of finance. And quite interesting, I mean, people wa want to um want to know if there are arbitrages uh, available there on the market and if not well and if they are or can they be arbitraged or um or there are some um uh, some uh, barriers to actually be able to arbitrage now um, I want to also introduce uh the concept of collateralization and why is it important uh, ever since the global financial crisis, uh, nearly 90% of uh, fixed income derivatives, this, uh, this is going to be quite heavy on the institutional background and the whole paper throughout. So I just want to give you the heads up on, on that. Um, uh, nearly 90%, uh, according to the ISDA, uh, um, is uh, fixed income derivatives are subject to some form of collateralization and they are uh, governed by the ISDA CSA agreements. When I say some form of collateralization, I actually mean it doesn't have to be a full collateralization, it can be partial collateralization and so on. The market uh, standard nowadays is to mark to market uh, derivative transactions daily. And uh, in the case of FX derivatives in particular and cross currency swaps, uh, the market standard is that the most commonly used collateral for, uh, for them, uh, if the currency pair involves US dollars, it is US dollars. So it is not like um, if the counterparties are like one counterparty is Euro and the other country is dollar that they will each post in their own currency, but they will actually have to post in majority of them in a commonly agreed currency and that is usually the US dollar. So what does collateralization act actually do to uh, derivatives? Obviously, it eliminates the counterparty risk. There is still some small uh, trace of risk uh, left, which is the jump risk, but we are not going to focus on that. It's 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 quite small, especially in the in the cross currency swaps. Um, um, but uh, there is an additional uh, addition of additional collateral cash flows 
which actually need to be taken into consideration. So these cash flows um, uh, actually change the funding that the derivatives, uh, how the, these derivatives are funded. For instance, they used to be funded um, uh, on uh, library rates, but nowadays uh, there are different rates and we will talk about these rates, um, you know, where, how they're, they're being funded. Now let's see where does this paper fit into the into the current literature. Um, uh, um, this paper is kind of related to three streams of literature. One is the literature on the CIP violations, where there are a lot of papers about the seminal paper being by Du and uh, Du et al. and um, from Journal of Finance, um, uh, which uh, basically was the first one to document these violations and was. Um, basically uh, linking it to uh, balance sheet constraints. Um, uh, the second, uh, and that is like kind of like post 2014, but even before that, pre 2014, there's, there is a stream of uh, literature by Baba et al, uh, mainly, uh, that uh, contributes the, uh, the violations of the covered interest rate party, mainly to counterparty and credit risk. So, you know, uh, pre-2014 uh, credit risk mainly, post-2014 balance sheet uh, constraints or balance sheet uh, regulatory constraints. Um, so, you know, there is a disconnect between these two uh, explanations, not that they are like mutually exclusive, uh, but there is still a, probably a need for a, a joint uh, uh, joint explanation of it. And then it is also related to a, a growing literature um, um, on a cash derivative basis and their link to funding value adjustments. Um, there are two new papers uh, by um, one of my advisors, Professor Longstaff, and uh, um, by Duffy et al. as well, who talk about this uh, funding value adjustments uh, in the format of uh, debt overhang on, uh, on the balance sheet of, uh, of dealers. Uh, so uh, the way it is related to this literature is that these, uh, what uh, they are talking about is mainly uh, non-collateralized transactions and how they can be heavy on the balance sheet. Uh, of uh, uh, of uh, dealers and what what this paper is talking about is more how uh, collateralized transactions uh, are affecting the balance sheet and whether there are um, possibilities for arbitrage due to that. Um, and then a third uh, third uh, stream of literature, which is uh, li related to the dealer's capital structure and the limits to arbitrage, as they are discussed by. Another of my advisors, Professor Murray and uh, et al., uh, Garland and, and Peterson, Bruno Meyer Peterson, and Schleifer and Wishon. Okay, so I hope that this paper will add to, to all that literature. And the paper is just introducing the collateralization and the need to collateralize because you're mark to marking the transactions on a daily basis nowadays. Uh, and the need to actually, uh, what now dealers are doing, the need to adjust for this opportunity cost of collateral uh, and that this cost of collateral is denominated in dollar currency, which is also putting a strain on foreign banks, for instance, who are searching to fund dollars. The conclusion is that, uh, that there are no persistent large violations to the CIP, of course, there are violations from, from time to time, or actually they're probably explained by the other papers, um, but uh, uh, the uh, cost of collateralization accounts for a big chunk of the uh, so-called apparent uh, uh, violations. Okay, I'm gonna skip this in interest of time. I want to introduce here now the, the, the whole concept. I want to introduce uh, uh, my measure of collateral opportunity cost, and that is uh, theta, which is actually equal to R minus C. R is the risk risk rate, and C it is the collateral rate that is agreed between the parties. Usually this collateral rate is uh, mentioned in the uh, collateral agreement, which is the CSA, and the standard rate that is used in the CSA is uh, the overnight rate, OIS rate, or the Fed funds rate, uh, if it's the US dollars. Um, 
so the collateral rate equal to IS rate. The risk-free rate, well, that is a little bit more difficult because nowadays it is a great controversy that um, actually they, nobody really knows what the risk-free rate is. And uh, the banks are actually using different risk-free rates for diff pricing different instruments. Um, so uh, what I will try to do is um, uh, in this paper is try to proxy this uh, risk-free rate, not in an explicit way, but in, uh, in an uh, implicit way, or uh, that's one way. And the second way is I will try to compare it to uh, by extracting this risk-free rate from the market, actually from cross-currency swaps itself. In any case, this uh, this cost of opportunity cost of collateral can be interpreted as some sort of a dividend yield on the collateral account for the collateral receiver, uh, or some sort of a collateral funding cost for the collateral payer. If we're looking at cross currency swaps, we want to take the difference between each currency, uh, uh, each currency's uh, opportunity cost of collateral. So just let's remember that theta is the opportunity cost of collateral, which is equal to the risk-free rate minus the collateral rate, which is the effective rate of, um, uh, of the dividend yield. So now, in the, in the, um, in the uh, context of how do we price uh, effects on cross-currency swaps uh, when there is collateralization, and why did I said that discount rates are actually changing? is that uh, now we need to take this, uh, this uh, collateral into account. Um, if we, uh, so when we price an FX forward, we would need to actually discount this at the OS rates, yes, in each currency, Plus, we would need this. We would need to add this opportunity cost of collateral. Now, the derivations of this, are in the interest of time, the derivations of these uh, formulas, both for the cross currency case and for the uh, FX forward, are in the appendix of the of the paper. But we can go later on if anybody has a more detailed question of why this uh, is actually here. But this is the nor. This is the formula that actually would satisfy the no arbitrage conditions. Now, if, you, if we look at this formula, it is actually the same as the CIP condition, which is here, only that this basis is equal to the cost of collateral here, uh, to, the co uh, to the opportunity cost of collateral. So basically, according to the no arbitrage framework, we have to, if we have that the cost of collateral is equal to the basis, we will not have an arbitrage at all. Um, so that is going to be the rest of the paper proving that, that uh, empirically. Um, so from the formula, I didn't show you here. Uh, I only showed you the FX forward, but how, what is an FX forward? But actually a cross currency swap would be similar to this. Um, uh, if you want uh, later, I can explain it. Uh, what is a cross currency swap and how it works and the pricing of it. But basically it is an exchange of, uh, of LIBOR's indexes between two currencies, uh, a, a, or actually I would say two uh, no, floating rate notes, exchange of two floating rate notes uh, strike uh, at the uh, current uh, spot FX, okay? So in addition to these cash flows, which are, let's say the, uh, the forward and the, and the spot that they have, there is a cash flow, which is the intermittent ca cash flows of LIBOR exchanges or uh, interest rates. Uh, otherwise, it is uh, very much similar to the FX forward. But remember that actually it is LIBOR exchanges and here we don't have LIBORs at all. Those LIBORs are discounted at the OIS rate. Again, I said at the OIS rate because that is the collateral rate that we are using. So what do we actually, what does matter actually according to all these no arbitrage, uh, uh, no arbitrage just simple pricing formulas, what matters for the cross currency swaps and how are they priced? Well, it is the opportunity cost of collateral, which unfortunately due to the risk free rate, there, we don't know what is the risk free rate. Uh, it is unobservable and we will try to uh, proxy it um, or extract it from, from the market. Then we have also the dynamics of the spot FX rates. 
Um, also, we, we have to bear in mind that when once we enter into a contract, throughout the life of the contract, of the FX uh, contract, uh, the, the, uh, the contract is marked to market. And the way it is marked to market, the most sensitive part of the mark to market, especially for FX uh, contracts, is because of the movement of the FX. So this movement will create big swings in the, in the mark to market, and we need to actually, uh, and that is going to provide need for uh, how much collateral to, to place um, or uh, to give or to receive. Uh, and then also for the, for, for, uh, only for the longer end of the, um, of the cross currency, which is the cross currency swaps, uh, we also have the LIBOR YS spread. Why? Because we are exchanging LIBOR, uh, LIBOR uh, cash flows and we're discounting those cash flows at the collateral rate, which is the OIS rate. So we, we automatically or mechanically, we're, we're gonna have the LIBOR OIS. Okay, now directly to the model. Um, I collected six pairs uh, of currencies. All of them are against the US dollar. Uh, so Japanese yen, pound, the Swiss uh, franc, euro, Australian dollar and Canadian dollar. These currencies all together represent around 80% of the FX trading uh, in the whole market. So <clears throat> it's a pr pretty representative uh, uh, sample. Uh, we uh, I'm looking at uh, one, five and 10 year cross currency swaps and um, uh, I'm also adding some interest rate swaps and OIS swaps just to be able to build the model. Um, and uh, that's on the longer end, on the shorter end, I'm looking at the FX forwards, one a week and three month FX forwards. I have the spot ask, uh, uh, FX spot ask, meet and bid prices so that I can also uh, get at the, at the liquidity. All data, apart from the Euro GC rates, is from uh, BM, who, which is from BMP Paribas, is from Bloomberg, um, and uh, the sample is from 2009 until uh, 31st of May 2020. So, first, I would like to say that the the the, the, the study is divided into two parts: the short end of the FX market and the longer end of the FX market. For the shorter end, we can actually proxy something for the risk-free rate, uh, because and that I use a proxy uh, uh, as a proxy for the risk-free rate. I use the GC repo rates, yes, which is some sort of an average safe or funding rate. Uh, it, I'm not saying that it's ideal, and I'm sure you you're gonna have comments about it, but uh, it is something uh, that is closer to the risk-free rate. Um, and up to three months, we uh, I'm able to use that data. But anything after three months, because uh, the repo rates don't have the, the term structure or it's not even liquid, um, um, I, I actually do another trick, which is that I uh, build the model based on the, um, on the no arbitrage model and uh, I extract the cost of collateral directly from the model. Now, this is a little bit circular, but I will uh, explain it uh, later how it works. So uh, building the proxy uh, of, uh, of the uh, uh, GC uh, of the uh, opportunity cost of collateral, um, I uh, use the GC rate uh, of, the, of each currency, the difference between the GC rate of uh, the each currency minus the collateral rate, which is the OIS for the same maturity. So for instance, I have reg a regression results for one week and for uh, three months, and but I'm using one week GC rate minus the one week OIS rate of one currency minus the GC rate of one currency minus the OIS rate of the other currency. And I regress it against the cross currency basis of the, of the same pair, okay? Um, I use fixed effects. Here I have the only four currency. I don't have the Australian dollar and the Canadian uh, dollar because I, I was unable to find the GC rate for those. Um, so we only have four. Um, I'm using cu currency cu fixed effects and um, currency pair, uh, sorry, currency pair fixed effects and year fixed effects. And I'm regressing the co opportunity cost of collateral against the basis controlling for other factors in the literature on, uh, that I mentioned before that have been used uh, uh, before, uh, before uh, and have been found to be significant. So as you can see, the opportunity cost of collateral, now let's say in this case uh, is uh, uh, 0 0.88 uh, um, um, 
uh, uh, with the with the uh, basis. So basically, uh, one basis point uh, change or one percent change in the uh, in the opportunity cost of collateral leads to zero point eighty eight change in the same direction uh, with the uh, with the basis. So it's quite sizable. Um, it's almost one to one for one, but that that works mainly on the uh, on the short end, very short end, so the one week. But I must say that the data is quite noisy, so the adjusted R square is not that high on the changes. So this is on the changes, and this is on the levels. Now, the levels is a similar magnitude. So again, 0 0.73, again, significant at uh, ab above 1%. Um, and uh, uh, when we add all the other uh, uh, controls, it still survives uh, by uh, its significance. Now I have to mention here also, um, yeah, so that is the only, actually that is the only factor that survives on the one week, more or less. Um, uh, USD as a factor and a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, research has been focused on the, uh, on the dollar as uh, the strength of the dollar as being um, very, very important. And uh, in this case, the USD factor as by, uh, which is uh, comprised by the Fed, um, yeah, it is like a composite of like a, the strength of the factor, which is like a composite of uh, uh, dollar currencies, uh, all currencies which are against the dollar and how much the dollar is uh, strength. It's trade trading trade based rather than uh, just uh, the currency. So this factor it doesn't seem to be very uh, important on the one week. However, on the three uh, month uh, uh, on the three month uh, data, it's actually important. Uh, again, we have the uh, again we have the um, the uh, cost of collateral being significant. Only that the impact is a little bit smaller than what it used to be on the one week uh, case. Now, I also want to mention here that the regional LIBOR OIS spread and the uh, sorry and the uh, is also significant, and that has been found in uh, other studies. And I would say that that's, that's the case because most likely um, um, not uh, all the transactions in the market are perfectly collateralized. So there is some remaining uh, risk and the U, uh, U, regional LIBOR OIS being some proxy, for instance, for a credit risk in the, in the uh, foreign country uh, banking sector, um, then that could be our banking sector be correlated with the sovereigns nowadays. Um, uh, that could be uh, uh, that could be why this thing is uh, these uh, variables are uh, important. So if there is a uh, if there is something that I would like you to take from this presentation is probably this uh, this graph. Now this is for uh, different currencies. I would maybe I don't know focus on the, the euro or the the yen, uh, where uh, I'm plotting here the for the one year the uh, the cross currency basis, which is the blue line. Okay, and uh, the uh, green line, which is the uh, which is the opportunity cost of collateral for for that country. So you can see that they follow each other, but it doesn't. They don't obviously on the big swings they don't uh, follow. So maybe on the big swings there are different uh, factors at play, and one of those factors could be obviously credit risk um, uh, or uh, or any other regulatory uh, um, balance sheet constraints. Okay, so that is the, the 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 proxy. Now let's see what about the longer end. About the longer end, what I do is I use the same formula, okay, uh, and I plug in all the variables that I know. So basically, I know the OIS from the markets. I know the li well the libraries for the cross currency. I know the libraries. I know the FX, uh, uh, the current spot rate. Um, I know the basis because it's quoted on the market, um, and then I plug it in into the formula and I extract this uh, cost of uh, collateral. Just that, that's the only thing which is unknown in the model. And then I like I extract it and I say, okay, so this is the, the cost of collateral. Now, does it, it doesn't have to be, but um, I, I'm correlating it with the, um, with the um, which I, I, do, I didn't show here because it's, it's a, it's a, 
a, it's a model that I'm uh, at the moment working on, but uh, I will show you now the correlation with the with the interest rate market so that you can see that um, that it's uh, it, it's it's most likely the the um, cost of collateral. Um, now. Um, this uh, cost of collateral is actually extracted directly from uh, from uh, cross currency uh, swaps. It is not extracted from uh, interest rate swaps. Now, why do I say that? Because cross currency swaps are different, and they're they're exposed to different risks, and mainly they're exposed to volatility in the FX. So, if the volatility in the FX is uh, high, and then also there are big swings in the FX, then the the need to collateralize is higher, and also that is going to put a strain on this uh, on this uh, uh, cost of collateral, um, in, in which is not the case if we just look at the uh, interest rate markets uh, itself, because the interest rate markets themselves are not very volatile, um, and uh, there are so big uh, mark to market uh, uh, mark to market uh, variations. Uh, also, in this case, I'm not just, I'm not really, I'm trying to price cross currency swaps. I'm just trying to observe the historical properties. Now, when I extract this, uh, this, uh, this is another, um, another graph that I'm trying to, that, that I would like you to take with you. Uh, when I uh, plot uh, the uh, opportunity cost of collateral against the basis, okay, for one year and five year tenors. And okay, let's focus on the five year tenor. Uh, the uh, blue line being the basis, the green line is the opportunity cost of collateral. As you can see, they are they're matching very, very well. Now, what is this uh, uh, orange line is actually the LIBOR OIS spread. So uh, many, many say, okay, how, so a LIBOR OIS spread is important for the basis, but according to this, if we look at it, it's not that correlated, but still it contributes to the basis, uh, to the violations. Okay, then the, I, I construct, uh, I compare this opportunity cost of collateral again with the basis for several occurrences. Uh, and I try to see their term structure. And uh, for instance, we can see for the Euro dollar, uh, the pound dollar, the Japanese uh, yen dollar, uh, Swiss, the Canadian US dollar, we can see actually that they, the term structures on different dates. I just randomly selected some dates. Uh, they are actually pretty much uh, say, the same. Uh, of course, there is always this difference between the two because of the LIBOR OIS. So yeah, there is uh, this um, correlation, let's, uh, le let's say. Now, if we are going to uh, try to correlate the, uh, to see the, the, you know, regressing the one, five year and 10 year uh, opportunity cost of collateral with the, uh, with the uh, basis, we can see that, you know, they're like highly significant and that it's, uh, you know, it's not one for one, but uh, one for like half almost uh, that is, is moving. And the adjusted R square obviously is uh, pretty high. Um, Actually, let me interrupt for a second. Can you think about trying to finish up in about five minutes? Yeah, 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 I'm done. I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, now I am just uh, trying to see. Um, yeah, there is one uh, in the in the uh, sorry in the. Um, yeah, would you mind if I just open the uh, paper? I'm uh, finishing with this uh, slide. Uh, Yeah, so I want to show that I also have uh, uh, made some regressions uh, with the uh, opportunity cost of collateral and other market variables such as interest rate swaps or um, uh, or um, uh, OIS or um, LIBORs and so on, and that uh, actually uh, none of it is significant. Uh, it is only the FX that correlates uh, uh, with the um, uh, that correlates with the, um, just one second, I will just share this other one. Yeah, so 
for instance, if we are to uh, compare the the uh, the correlation between the um, uh, opportunity cost of collateral, this is on the ten year, but on the five year, uh, with the regional OISS or the other interest rate swaps or the FX, uh, sorry, the other FX, then it's totally not related. So it's not uh, some sort of so the cost of collateral is not some sort of an interest rate related uh, cost. Uh, but it is very much related to the FX and the explanation why uh, it is related to the FX is because uh, the FX is the is the component that actually moves the mark to market and therefore adds the need for the posting of collateral, uh, which is uh, uh, why we are having this uh, increased uh, cost of collateral. So, so far, that is the uh, that is uh, that has been the analysis. The remaining analysis that uh, uh, stays is obviously uh, to relate uh, this cost of collateral to other measures of balance sheets, uh, such as leverage ratio and so on, to see if these, uh, these variables are actually affecting the cost of collateral. Uh, but in any case, whether we, whether we compare them or we don't compare them to the cost of collateral, we, that would just help not establish that there is a collateral channel, but would just uh, uh, would just help uh, uh, explain how does this collateral channel actually work, um, and that is uh, the next step uh, together with the uh, with the uh, applying this analysis to other uh, asset classes such as interest rate uh, derivatives uh, or credit derivatives. So that's all. Well, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Um... I just have a very simple question, which may have been in the slides, but I managed to overlook it. So your cost of collateral theta, how large is it? Uh-huh, yes. So uh, uh, the basis, okay, uh, the basis is around 20 basis points, okay, minus 20 basis points on average. Uh, on the five year, uh, and uh, the uh, cost of collateral is something like 15, okay? But there is a lot of variation in that because during periods of stress, it is like 150 or 200. So I think that this, uh, this minus 20 is uh, like a kind of like a, a deceiving number. Plus, if we're gonna look at the five year or 10 year maturities, uh, this is an annualized rate, but if you look at having a transaction like that, then your mark to market uh, or you, your profit and loss is multiplied by the number of years. So if it's 20 basis points, you know, the, the, if there is a movement of 20 basis points, your profit and loss is more or less multiplied by five. Let me see. So it's 20 basis points. It's 20 basis points of the notional amount because there's 20 basis points that shows up in the discount rate and the discount rate is discounts all the cash flows. Yes. So, so I, I mean, maybe it does, but I'll, I'll ask my naive question. So the, the mark to market is going to be only a small fraction of the notional amount. And the collateral is based on the mark to market. So 20 basis points on the notional amount is going to be a huge fraction of the collateral you have to post. So does this make sense? Or why does this, am I thinking about it incorrectly? You mean 20 basis points being an additional, uh, uh, additional, uh, um, so 20 basis points is used to discount the cash flows of the cross currency swap. And there's an, you typically an exchange of currencies at the end. So it's, so it's 20 base. I th my understanding is it's 20 basis points per year, of course, per year of the notional amount, but 20 basis points of the notional amount would be a large fraction of the collateral requirement, or am I just confused? Um, Not really, but like the way I see it is um, like, um, so for instance, let's say we have a transaction, which is a cross currency swap, which is a hundred, yes, uh, notional. And you have uh, a 20 basis points uh, arbitrage opportunity, uh, arbitrage opportunity. 
Now, 200, uh, let's say 20 basis points on uh, uh, 1 billion, because usually these transactions are very, very uh, uh, notional. We don't want to look at it as a 20 basis points. We want to look at it how much it is from, you know. But let's say that this is 20 basis points on a 1 billion notional, uh, uh, and it's a five-year transaction, yes? I'm going to have to multiply the five times the 20, and that's going to be 1% on 1 billion. And yes. It's, yes. So if it's, a, if it's uh, some bank, yes, that is going to put a strain on the balance sheet, and they would need to fund that position. So let's say that they would fund that position instead of uh, one percent they because it's a bigger a big position. Let's say uh, they fund it at one point two <laughs> or one point one percent. So it is it makes the the whole um, you know um, it makes the whole divi like it makes the whole arbitrage uh, opportunity. Okay. Uh, on. Okay, you wouldn't great. be able to arbitrage it. That's that's how I view it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then a question from Dimitri. Are there any regulatory changes that serve as a shock to the collateral requirements? Do you have any exogenous shocks to the collateral requirements? Yes, that's 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 a very good question. Now, there is no 100% exogenous, okay? Uh, but for instance, the uh, requirements to uh, uh, be uh, traded via the central uh, clearing systems uh, is uh, something that um, requires banks to post collateral. So if, you, if one is to view these transactions before and after the introduction of this uh, clearing system, and that actually for the cross currency ha happened in 2015, uh, then uh, one would see, see some sort of uh, difference. Um, obviously, there are a lot of arguments of whether it is exogenous or not, but uh, it is uh, one step uh, further to understanding uh, this collateral channel. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? If other people have questions, you should feel free to unmute yourself and use the microphone. Okay, in that case, thanks very, thank you, thanks very much to our presenters and our everyone who comes to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great presentations.